So I'll begin reading here in 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 4. At verse 15, I'll read to verse 19. We'll get into our study. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 through 19. Peter writes, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Now, Peter has been writing an encouragement to a church, to a group of people that are suffering. And part of the reason that they have been suffering in the past, there were people suffering in the past, was over lifestyle choices. Um, they are no longer living to satisfy their own lust, and yet they're still suffering to some degree. But they are now suffering because of a life that is glorifying God. Now, Peter had made it clear that the unsaved um, thought that the way these believers lived was strange. Unbelievers didn't understand why they didn't live immoral lives. Uh, believers weren't promiscuous. They weren't filled with lust. They weren't drunks. They weren't partying. They weren't idolaters. And this, Peter said, was strange. They think it's strange. And the word strange is a word that is, it means bewildering. This was strange, bewildering to the unbelievers, to the pagans, because these are the kinds of things that made up pagan society. Christians, though, were different. So the response of the pagans was to speak poorly, to gossip about believers. They gossiped because Christians didn't live immoderate or excessive lifestyles. So that made them weird and subject to slander. And because believers were rejected, pressure had been put on them constantly. So they're suffering, they're being rejected, and they are constantly enduring pressure. Now, I want to give you a little bit more information to develop this one point. At this time, the Roman emperor was a man by the name of Nero. Nero, Nero was the emperor from 54 to 68 AD. And it was under him that the first sanctioned persecution of believers occurred. Christians during this time were referred to as evildoers. And they began to be punished for a variety of things. They were punished, for example, for illegal assemblies. You see, as Christians, we had uh, rejected the Roman idolatry. And because of that, it, it was beginning, and this is what they said, to undermine social mores. And, and they were upset because the believers were treating slaves decently. And so what happened is Christianity was transforming society. And societies don't like being transformed. And the response against them was brutal. So in the year 80, uh, 64 A.D., Nero began to publicly execute believers. You see, believers would be taken and commanded to renounce their faith in Christ. And if they wouldn't do that, they were brutally killed. What he would do is he pitted them against savage dogs. Some of them he crucified. Some he burned alive. One writer says a particularly gruesome form of execution was to burn Christians alive as human torches. Nero was known for his gardens, which he lit up at night with torches. According to some accounts, Nero would have Christians tied to stakes and covered in tar or pitch before setting them on fire. And the burning bodies became living torches used to light up the gardens, creating a spectacle for Nero's guests. And so when we speak about being persecuted today because people said something mean to us, we need to put those things into context. Because the early believers were, were massacred, they were murdered, tortured, crucified, burned alive. And so these people during this day 
are undergoing tremendous persecution and affliction. And so the question is, are we going to survive? And if so, how can we handle this? How can we come out of this victorious? Now, Peter had made it clear that one of the ways to do so was to do the very basic things. He said, know that the end of all things is at hand. Be sober, he said. Be prayerful. He said, love your Christian family. Care for one another. Exercise your spiritual gifts. Remain confident in sharing the gospel. Walk and serve in the spirit of God. And remember that the suffering that you're enduring is refining your faith because it is part of partaking in, in Christ's suffering. In verse 12 and 13, he had said in this chapter, Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake, notice, partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Partake, you partake of Christ's sufferings. And so what does that mean? You're partaking in Christ's sufferings. Well, by identifying with Jesus Christ as belonging to him, one, we suffer because we identify with him. We also suffer because like him, we suffer because we do that which is right. How do we suffer with Christ? While well, we also partake of his sufferings in that our hearts are broken by a sinful world. Every Christian who loves the Lord and cares about people, every Christian ought to have a broken heart. A broken heart. Because we live in a broken world. And we have friends and we have family and neighbors or co-workers or students we go to school with or whatever. We, we encounter people all the time who are suffering and are going through great pain and and, and we see a fallen world, and, and that ought to cause us grief. It ought to cause us to have a heart that suffers for that which is lost. Remember how that Jesus was uh, told by uh, Martha, and Mary, Martha and Mary, who were brothers of a man named Lazarus, he was told that Lazarus, the one whom you love, it was suffering and near death. You know the story of that, how that the Lord Jesus Christ said this suffering is to the glory of God. Ultimately, he went to where Lazarus was. Lazarus had already been dead. And how that Jesus went to, um, to the place that he had been laying in. And the scripture says to us, and it's the shortest New Testament verse here. Anybody can memorize uh, John eleven thirty two. 32. It simply says, Jesus wept. And so you see in the life of Christ that he wept over a friend. And the people, when they saw this taking place, they said amongst themselves, Behold, how he loved him. And so Jesus wept. He wept over a friend because look what death, look what sin has done. The wages of sin is death. And so you can go to a Christian funeral and you can weep because your mother, your dad, a brother, a sister, a child, a friend has died. And you grieve, not because you've lost them, you know where they're at, but because you loved them deeply and will miss them deeply. And so we, we carry on with Christ's sufferings in the sense that we grieve over those kinds of losses. We partake in his, his suffering when we are also concerned for, for the city that we live in. Remember how that that Jesus had begun to enter into Jerusalem and he had stopped and the scripture tells us that he began to weep over the city. If you'd only known this, the day of your visitation, but you're about to suffer through destruction. You're, in, in, in a few years from now, you'll be destroyed. So I see that Jesus wept for a person, but he also wept over a city and, and we also see in Hebrews chapter 5 that, that he had wept in a garden when he was preparing to yield up his life and was about to, to pay the cost of salvation. Hebrews 5 verse 7 says, During his life on earth, Jesus prayed to God, who could save him from death? He prayed and pleaded with loud crying and tears. 
He was heard because of his devotion to God. Jesus cried. So we, we partake of Christ's sufferings. We too agonize over the lost. We partake in his sufferings when we realize the cost of salvation, a salvation that we by faith received. We, we suffer internally at the cost of salvation. And when we come to understand that more deeply, what that does is it develops a deeper burden within us. When we begin to understand what it costs Christ to save us, it breaks our heart and makes us more aware of what he gave for us. And, and we suffer because we can be treated in a similar way that he was. Remember in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 21, uh, he had said, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And so, he had said in verse 14, If you reproach for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Again, not all suffering is for Jesus' sake. Some people suffer simply because they're sinning. A murderer, a thief... Or an evildoer is mentioned here in verse 15. None of you should suffer in that way. These things are basically giving to us a picture of of sin. It's just revealing to us the kinds of sin in all. And so what he's referring to and speaking to us is that we are not to suffer in this way because murderers, thieves, and evildoers are receiving just compensation for the things that they've done. But it's interesting how he does this, and I want to look at this for just a moment. He said, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, and an evildoer. We all know those are bad things. But how about busybody? You know, that guy's going to, have, he's going to die. Why? Because he's a busybody. I mean, that's not a word that we use commonly or would necessarily, and I'll develop this with you, would necessarily lump in with those other sins. A busybody... A busybody doesn't seem to be that bad, to be honest with you, but a busybody speaks of someone involved in someone else's private matters. It speaks of meddling with other people's concerns and forgetting their own. At 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12 says it like this, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands, just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Mind your own business and work with your hands. So the question is asked, why why is a busybody included in the same verse as murderers? Well, part of the reason is this, and you might find this interesting when you consider it. Part of the reason is that busybodies or meddlers are destructive. Their intrusion into other people's lives will divide a church. If you have a church filled with people meddling in other people's affairs, watching you, you know, we used to call them sin sniffers, (laughs) gospel gestapos. People are so interested in what you do, what you say, and all of those things, it undermines the church. It undermines fellowship. And so what they do is they create division. But it, it's been said that they major in the trivial and they neglect what matters most. And the result is to disrupt the peace of the, of the body of Christ. First Timothy 5.13 says that they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. And so they enter in and interfere with people's private affairs without an invitation to speak concerning those things. Now, it's important as a believer to know that I, I, I should be involved in other people's lives. I, I should be concerned and caring about them, of course. But I also need to not be overly curious about their personal lives. And we need to know when it's important and proper to intervene If you step into somebody's affairs without an invitation, then all you are to them is a critic. And they're going to feel judged and angry at you. If you see something's going on and and you know something needs to be said, not because people are telling you this, but because you're well aware that there's truth to your concern, you know these things are happening. 
what, is, what should you do so you're not meddling? Well, one, I, I take it to the Lord in prayer. And I ask the Lord, secondly, in prayer, I ask him, Lord, would you give me opportunity to address this so I might be of help to them to be set free from this? And that's how I've done it for many, many years. Because if you just intrude and say, oh, by the way, I know what you've been doing, that's not a good thing. But if you're having a conversation and they say something to you that opens the door for conversation, you're not meddling, you're actually ministering. It's because you took those things to the Lord. You asked the Lord for wisdom and ability to share with them because you have a loving concern for them. But if I just look at everybody else just trying to find out what, what that sinner's doing today so I can talk to them about it, that's just not, that's not the way to do it. You see, this is all related to my motives and, and what I desire to accomplish by speaking to them. And so if I do, and if you do, and if you find something you need to speak about, you need to do so factually. You don't bring in gossip and all of that. You speak about what you know, and you also do it lovingly. I, I've discovered that when you cry with someone because you love them and you're concerned for them, and they see that that's love and not, not, not being harsh and overly critical or self-righteous, they're more open to listening to the, to the words uh, that you're speaking because the tenderness of your heart reveals to them that you have a loving concern for them. So he says, don't be a busybody. Don't be going about meddling in other people's affairs uh, because they're, they're generally, generally rejected by people. And sometimes uh, this would even cause someone to reject the gospel. So he's speaking about this. He said, don't suffer in this way. But, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, suffering because you're a criminal or a busybody, well, that's justifiable. That's understandable. But what happens when you actually suffer because you're a believer? Now, notice he speaks of suffering here for being a Christian. So we need to remember something. I'll develop this for, for just a moment. When he says this, suffering for being a Christian... You, if anyone suffers as a Christian, we need to remember that during this day, being called a Christian was derogatory. Today, we speak of ourselves as Christians. That's something that's accepted. It's an acceptable thing. We're describing ourselves as followers of Christ. But in the earlier days, it was actually something that, that was used to deride believers. Remember when we were going through the book of Acts, I mentioned this to you in, in chapter 11. It says in verse 26 of the book of Acts that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Before, they were referred to as disciples or brothers, believers, saints. They were referred to as the church, even were called the way. But it was in Antioch that they were first called Christians. And one commentator had pointed out that the disciples didn't use that word necessarily of themselves when they were speaking amongst themselves and of themselves. Normally, they would speak of themselves as brethren or believers or even the saints. But Antioch, Antioch was known as a city that invented nicknames. And so believers were associated with Christ, and so they called them Christianus. And the word Christianus speaks of belonging to or possessed, in possession of, of Christ. That's what that word literally means. And the word was used in a derogatory fashion because the word Christian implies a slave-master relationship. And because slavery was, was rejected and, and considered to be a disgusting way of life, to call someone a Christian was a word that would be used in a derogatory fashion. Why? Because it was humiliating to be a slave. Now, Christians know that we belong to Christ, and we also speak of ourselves as his servants. You might find it interesting to note that often when you're reading your New Testament and the word servant is used, you could actually take a stronger word, which normally would have been used in earlier times, and the word that would be used was slave. So we're not simply servants. The Bible refers to us as slaves, purchased by the blood of Christ and owned by him. So we are his slaves. We are his servants. That's what Christians are. And he is our Lord because he's the one who bought us. 
And he's the one who owns us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies and your spirit, which belongs to or which are God's. He purchased us. And I didn't develop a whole study on this, but he took us out of the marketplace of sin. And he purchased us and made us his own. He redeemed us, the purchase price being the blood of Jesus. So when he took us out of slavery, we became his slaves. And so that's why Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Because at that time, slaves were obligated to keep the word of their master. And yet he's saying, you're my slave, and yet you rebel against the things I command you to do. How can you call me your Lord when you refuse to obey my commands? That's why he would say, if you love me, keep my commands. And that's how it worked. We know that we belong to Christ. And so what, what happened is we took this name for ourselves because we are voluntary slaves of Jesus Christ. And instead of it being humiliating, it actually is liberating. Now, Peter would be saying, don't be ashamed because you suffer as a Christian. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. And as a result, refuse to suffer because of it. Don't be ashamed of being his follower. He wasn't ashamed of you. Some of us know what it feels like for someone to say, I'm ashamed of you. And if you ever heard someone say that of you, it must have hurt you. My brother said that to me one time when I was a little boy. And I'll never forget it. Obviously, at my age, I'm 41 years old now. <laughs> Obviously, at my age, I still remember crying because he said, I'm ashamed of you. I'm ashamed to call you my brother. And, and that's, a, that's a painful thing. And some people would refuse. They would refuse to be associated with Christ. But he's saying, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't refuse to suffer because you belong to him. Don't be ashamed of being his follower. He wasn't ashamed of you. In Hebrews 2.11, Jesus and the people he makes holy all belong to the same family. And this is why he isn't ashamed to call them his brethren. He's not ashamed of you. Why would you be ashamed of him? Why does it matter if that person on the job ridicules you? What does it matter if your next door neighbor thinks you're an idiot? What does that matter? You know, I really do believe that uh, we need to toughen up a bit today. Um, we're thin-skinned. We get insulted too easily. We shouldn't be ashamed of Christ. He's not ashamed of me. And I love him. You see, believers should only be ashamed when they're doing wrong. But we should never feel shame when we're doing right. Uh, I was thinking about this. I'll develop it for a moment here. Shame in our day is almost always considered in the negative. And people can grow so accustomed to sin that they feel no shame. They no longer feel any guilt. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 15, the question is asked, were they ashamed because of the abomination they've done? They were not even ashamed at all. Listen to this. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. They don't even know how to blush. That's true in our society, isn't it? Without going into a big social commentary. That's true in our society. Sometimes you see, you know, males and females in it, dressing immodestly and even using that word they say, well, look at you, you old man. You're just from a different time. You don't get it. But, you know, I don't know. There are just there's some things that are just simply improper because they're too revealing. Um, somebody said there were three things that never lie. Um, let's see. A, a, a baby, a young child, a drunk and yoga pants, and I think that that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it 
So be aware. <laughs> they don't know how to blush. Listen, a proper shame, a proper sense of I've done wrong or this isn't right. Uh, when the Holy Spirit convicts you in that way, it can lead to what is called genuine repentance. Listen, a sense of shame can reveal an awareness of doing something wrong, and that shame can be the result of conviction. In 2 Corinthians, I'll give you an example, chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Paul said it like this. He said, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For he says, you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. There's a proper place for us being aware that we have acted in a shameful way. So he's saying, don't be ashamed about being a Christian. Don't be ashamed for doing that which is right. Don't be ashamed of your relationship with Jesus. Now, Peter would understand that because remember, Peter is the one who denied the Lord three times. And so he would understand what he's saying. And, G and he would remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 33, when Jesus said, whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who's in heaven. So don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, 4, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. This judgment is a refining of the body of Christ. It is a purging of the body of Christ, of the evil. And he reveals evil and he purges the body of sin, but also he purges the body of false believers. And these false believers are revealed by the response to rejection, persecution, because that is being exposed by their falling away or walking away. So one of the ways that God purges the church is through exposing the false. Now, when a leader in the church, when a pastor or well-known TV evangelist or whatever, when a pastor or leader is exposed, that actually has a way of purifying the body of Christ. When they see what happened to that person who involved themselves in that sin, it ought to put fear in the heart of the individuals who are witnessing that, realizing that God loves his church so much that he'll purge it of sin, even if it means taking out somebody who has a reputation of being some great one in his kingdom. God has a way of exposing that which is false. And over the years that I've walked with the Lord, I've seen him expose quite a number of of those who were profiting from the gospel in an improper way and, and were exposed for their sin. And God purges the church of this. And again, I, I have wept over the, the pastors who have been exposed, but I also know that that is going to cause the, the body of Christ to be, to be healthier because sin has been removed from it, and now it can, it can have a healing process and it can become purified now uh, since that's been removed. You see, if God is this tough on a believer, he's saying, what's going to happen to the unbeliever? If God deals with believers in this fashion, how about those who don't know him? And so we need to be aware of that. And therefore, verse 19, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Those who are suffering suffer according to the will of God? These are those who haven't committed any crimes. These are those who are being persecuted for their faith in the Lord. He had said in chapter 3, verse 17, uh, it's better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so we need to be aware of the fact that there are things that we will go through that we will say, I don't understand why we're going through this. 
And what I've learned to do over time is I've learned to entrust myself to the Lord. There have been things, and I'll just say this quickly, but there have been things over the years where, where, where things have been said about, about me as a, as a pastor um, and, and, and just as a man that, that were so vicious. And you, you ask yourself, why, why are you grieving my heart? Like, why are you saying that? Why did you say those things? Why are you saying those things? I remember somebody who had said, and I'll give you one example of it. I try not to remember these things, but I'll remember this one for you. A um, couple things now. I should stop. I remember someone saying, David can't possibly love his wife that much. He's got to have someone on the side. I'll never forget that one. And I said to John, that's, that's hurtful, John. You shouldn't say those things. Yeah, another time when someone said, you know, I don't want to hear stories about his children or his grandchildren. People, people can say things that grieve you and hurt you, and, uh, and, and, and it can discourage you. You know, it can. And there are times that you may be in the neighborhood sharing with somebody or perhaps on the job site or whatever, and you're telling them about the love of the Lord. And then they go and whisper to somebody else who whispers to somebody else. And before you know it, they're giving you sidelong glances and saying things behind your back. And, and it hurts your feelings. I, 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 I feel that um, sometimes we can, be, we, we can be hurt. There's just the reality of the fact that we're human beings. And, and we don't want people speaking poorly of us. And we don't want people gossiping about us. And we don't want people rejecting us and, or speaking of our of our children or our families or our friends or whatever. And it hurts. But it, it, it can also hurt when they say, that, that person's a freak. I mean, all they talk about is, is Jesus. Well, why do they have... And, and you can say, man, this hurts my feeling. Why? Well, don't be surprised. You know, don't be surprised. I, I asked my own pastor, Chuck Smith, one time many years ago. I said, Chuck, I said, you've got a thick skin. Anybody who, who knew Pastor Chuck would know he had thick skin. And I asked him, were you born with that? Or did you develop it? I'd like to know. Were you born with that? Are you just indifferent to criticism? Or did you develop it? And Chuck was one of these who would take us. He always took a second before he'd answer. He, he didn't have a quick response. He, was just, he had a habit of peeling his thumbnail. And he just would kind of look at it like that. Oh, and he'd go like that, oh. And that was Chuck, you know, and you say you have to wait on his answer. But I, I memorized the answer. He said it was a combination. It's a combination of both. He said, over time, you learn to have a tougher skin. But it's a good thing if you were born with the ability to not be overwhelmed by people's opinions of you. And he said that in, in, in the case of ministers, time and experience produces the ability to receive the criticisms that will come because they're inevitable. And when you are persecuted or rejected for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory rests upon you. If you're going to suffer at all, Peter's saying, don't suffer as an evildoer. If people are upset and speak about you, don't suffer because what they're saying is true. Don't do those things. Don't be the one who's the busybody. Don't be the one who's interfering in people's affairs. Don't be the one who meddles, who comes in, who's always judging or hard. Don't be any of those things. Love the Lord and love people. Share with them how good Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Ask the Lord to give to you an overabundance, a superabundance, an outpouring of his love so that you can pour those on the ones who spitefully use you instead of wanting to get even. You know, because you know, sometimes people say, well, I've been praying for them. Yeah, what kind of prayers? Well, I've been praying Old Testament prayers. You know, smite them, O oh Lord, break their teeth. <laughs> well, that's probably not the proper way to approach those things. Learn to pray for those who have harmed you. Learn to pray for those who speak evil of you. Learn to pray for them because they don't know the Lord or because they're far from him. 
Learn to have compassion on people who don't have anything better than to gossip about others. Learn to have compassion on sinners whose only way that they know how to live is a way that is rejecting God. Have compassion on them. Pray for them. I'm not saying to accept all the sin and say it's okay. I'm not saying that at all. Pray that God gives you the ability to communicate the truth, a truth that sets them free, a truth that can heal them, a truth that will uh, awaken them to themselves so that they might come to the one who forgives and transforms lives. Pray in that way. Ask God to give you the ability to care for those who are difficult to care for, to love those who are difficult to love. One of the things I learned a long time ago because I've prayed for many years, God, help me to learn to love people. As he says, are you sure? And yes, of course. And then the most unlovely people come into my life. <laughs> you know, maybe that's happened to you. Maybe you've said, God, help me to learn to love even the most unlovable. And then you got married. <laughs> and had kids. <laughs> if anyone suffers, let them not suffer as a Christian. Be aware of the fact that judgment begins in the house of God, that God loves the bride and the bride is to be pure and God will purify the church. And he does so by exposing sin, by bringing conviction and by rooting out the evil that pollutes it. And so if you're suffering at all, let it be because you love the Lord, you serve Jesus, you preach to others, and you care about them. Because that's something that God rewards. And what we need to do is we need to entrust ourselves to the will of God. Because like it said again in chapter 3, verse 17, it's better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for evil. So in light of this, we should live patiently. We should trust him. And we should continue to do good. We should commit our souls to him. We should hand over to him those things that we value. We should entrust those things to his care. And we should, we should place our lives confidently in his hand, knowing that he'll care for us. In Psalm 9, verse 9, it says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalm 61, verse 3 says, you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. So in doing good, you're going to remain in the center of God's protective care and continually faithful, continuing faithfully serving him, it would be said, is the path of safety. So therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. God hears your cry. God doesn't abandon you. I will never forsake you. I will never abandon, leave you. I will never do that. I will never, never, never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And those are those that, I'll close with this thought. That has been one of the keys to the longevity of my spiritual life is when I discovered God's word making that promise I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. Though you may be alone, like Jesus said, yet he said, I am alone. Now I'm alone, and yet I'm not alone, for you are with me. When I was a little boy, and I'll close with one last illustration. I was not, never has, have been, but I was not really the, the popular one. I was just one of those who was invisible. I was the invisible kid. And I got used to it. It taught me not to ask for attention. It, it taught me that if someone wants to give you attention, they will. If they don't, that's fine too, because you should not and don't have to live wishing someone noticed you. So a long time ago, I made a determination that as, as a Christian that if there's anybody's love that I should really desire. I made the decision that the love that I should greatly desire is the love that I have for my God. And so that gave me a confidence. That gave to me an ability to be myself. And if someone doesn't like me, that's fine. Others do. That's okay. You don't have to. I have the attitude. You don't have to like me. I wish you did. All of us wish everybody liked them. But the fact is, not everybody's smart enough to like me. No, it, 
<laughs> the fact is, not everybody does, right? So live with it. So live with it. Don't be a chameleon changing for everybody's opinion to become popular. Please the Lord first. Enjoy him. There'll be circles of people who do the same thing. That becomes your fellowship. It becomes your spiritual family. It becomes the ones that matter. And the others, you know what? If God gives you opportunity to minister to them and, and somehow they say, you know what? I like you. I'd like you to be my friend. That's great. But if they look at you and they say, I don't like you. You're a Jesus freak. You know, you're too. Well, you know, it's, it's your loss. I can be a good friend. I love Jesus. I could pray for you. There's so much that we could have in him, but you don't want it. Well, you know what? I, I leave those things alone. And I also have grown to know that there's one thing that matters at the very end, and it's the well done that I want to hear from Jesus. That's the one thing that really matters. And that's how, that's how you should live. So continuing and pursuing him and following him and loving him, even if it's difficult in times, well, the bottom line is, as you continue to faithfully serve him, you are in the center of his will, and that is, as it's been called, that is the path of safety. He cares for those because he loves those who do so.